Good morning. Uh, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our, our guests for Scholarship Weekend. Um, really, it's very, very special for us to have you here. We're, we're really grateful that you're here. Would you be so kind as to stand so that we can, we can welcome you? Uh, for those of you here for Scholarship Weekend, just a, uh, a quick reminder that at 11.45 p.m., uh, right after chapel, or 11.45 a.m., right after chapel, um, John Plating is going to, to be here uh, doing a question and answer time. Um, he's our director for calling and career. Uh, so please uh, stick around for that, and uh, John will have um, great stuff for you. Uh, also want to announce next week, Monday through Wednesday, we're going to have our Imago Day conference. Um, our speaker this year is going to be Pastor James White. Um, he was here about a year and a half ago, um, has become a dear friend, and will be a great blessing uh, to be uh, in the midst of our community. Also want to announce, as part of the Imago Day Conference, on Tuesday night, um, in the lobby of Carter Hall, we're going to kind of set it up specially, and we're going to have uh, a freedom concert featuring our own Nabil Ince. So that's Tuesday. Yeah. <clears throat> And he told me he's going to bring it. So uh, eight, o 8 o'clock in the Carter Hall lobby. Um, so the fact that chapel is not church affords me the opportunity to do uh, some things that, that I would never do in church. Um, and this morning, that's going to happen. Um, used to preaching expository exegetical sermons from Scripture. Uh, this morning, I'm going to exegete something a uh, little um, less grandiose in some ways, but just as not just as, but quite beautiful in another. Um, I, I'm not on Facebook often. Um, I have a Facebook account. I've never actually posted anything on Facebook, but, but I see good stuff there, and I have friends that post things. And um, I was on the other night, and I, I read a post by one of you. Uh, and it, it um, was such a beautiful reminder of the gospel. Um, and it was, uh, I, it was just really beautiful. So I... I talked to Victoria Yang, who posted it, and I asked her if I could um, share it with you this morning. So we're going, to, uh, we're going to look at Victoria's Facebook post this morning. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna weave some scripture and scriptural truths in there. Um, I met Victoria. Victoria came in um, as a freshman the first year that I was here. I bumped into her early on in the mailroom. Um, and she was opening a box, and as she opened the box, she produces this large green dinosaur costume. Um, I'm like, Victoria, are you going to wear it? She's like, yeah. So the next morning, she shows up in chapel in a bright green dinosaur costume. Um, I've since gotten to know Victoria, and um, that fits her personality quite well. Uh, she's a Nick incredibly articulate um, writer, and I think you'll see a bit of her heart as I read. So, Facebook. I'm about to say goodbye to college, and I have more anxiety than anything else. There are days where I feel like I didn't do anything in my time here, and that I've wasted these four years. I look at others' LinkedIn's, and I feel discouraged because anything I've done in these past few years pales to their feats. I'm not ready to bid goodbye and enter into a world that is probably less receptive to my goofy self. But four years ago, I finished up 12-ish years of speech therapy, and I spent weeks sitting in the speech therapy room with my therapist, practicing the phrase, I go to Covenant College in Lookout Mountain, because I couldn't even say that that well. We also spent a long time trying to get my phone speech to text to understand me. It had a 40% chance of understanding me. Four years later, my phone understands me 85% of the time, and Siri never fails to give me directions to where I need to go. Hey, Chipotle. I've survived oral presentations, leading prayer and club meetings, internships involving tens of mission trip participants, cold calling, Dr. Horn classes, and article discussions, taking four classes completely in Spanish and getting a Spanish minor, and even screaming across the room in Covenant Chapel. 
we know what that is. <laughs> I've been quite apprehensive about job searching because of fears for an inability for others to understand me. But hey, I think I might be fine. I am not defined by my speech. The Father's grace is sufficient, especially in my weaknesses, and he hasn't failed to remind me of that in these past four years. And in return, we've been having the best dang adventure of my life. So if you're looking for someone who may not be your typical employee, hit me up. You may have to be extra patient with understanding me, but I'll work extra hard to compensate for it. Can we pray? Yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's, yeah. Um, as folks here previewing for Scholarship Weekend, um, this, this gives you a little bit of a taste of what happens at Covenant College. Um, and I think it speaks to many of us right where we are. She starts off by saying, I'm about to say goodbye to college and I have more anxiety than anything else. And I know that's a sentiment that, that's ripe on our campus right now as seniors are looking to graduation. But for those of you who are visiting, I'm sure you're also experiencing that, looking um, the transition from high school to college. And you're feeling that anxiety and you're feeling the, the challenges that come with transition. And transition is hard. Um, even good and exciting change can breed anxiousness. Um, and I want to come back to that in just a moment, but let's move just a little bit here. There are days when I feel like I didn't do anything in my time here and that I've wasted these four years. I look at others' LinkedIn's and I feel discouraged because anything I've done in these past few years pales to their feats. And I do not say this flippantly, um, but this is true. It is not about what you have done, and it is not about what you will do. It is about what God has done in and through you. Most of the things that have eternal value will not show up on LinkedIn. If you've been here and you have loved your brothers and sisters, if you've listened, if you've prayed, if you've challenged and cried with and for others, if you've been the hands and feet of Jesus to the brothers and sisters that God has placed you in community with here, your time has been far from in vain. I'm not ready to bid goodbye and enter into a world that's probably less receptive to myself. And I'll tell you this, graduating seniors, we're honestly not ready for you to go. Um, the idea of you leaving is not something that uh, uh, comes easily, right? Uh, my daughter is 18 years old. She's getting ready to come to Covenant next year. And being very honest, I'm not ready for her to go. But it is what she's been raised up and trained for. And it's what you have been raised up and trained for. And God has plans to use you to further his kingdom and his glory. You will come here and you will go from here as ambassadors to our king. As far as the world being ready for you, for any of us, for that matter, the world is always ready and the world is never ready for people who will come and walk in and love with the love of Jesus. So back to this idea of being anxious. Um, anxiety is tied to uncertainty, right? Anxiety is bred when we're uncertain of the outcome of what lies before us. The Israelites, they were anxious before Pharaoh when they were called to make more bricks, the same amount of bricks, without the straw that had been provided. The disciples, they were anxious when their Savior had been crucified because neither could see how God's hand was in the unfolding of what was before them. But God was not silent, and he's not silent now. And the uncertainty that's before us dissolves as we look backwards. And that's exactly what Victoria does. Hear this. Four years ago, I finished up 12-ish years of speech therapy, and I spent weeks sitting in the speech therapy room with my therapist, practicing the phrase, I go to Covenant College on Lookout Mountain, because I couldn't even say that that well. 
this reminds us, we don't always know what our brothers and sisters are going through when they're here. We don't always know the story of where they've come from. We don't always know their struggles. But here what happens is Victoria looks back. We also spent a long time trying to get my phone to uh, recognize my speech to text had a 40% chance of understanding. But now, four years later, my phone understands me 85% of the time. Siri never fails to give me directions where I need to go. I've survived. But she hasn't just survived. She says, hey, I think I might be fine. In the face of anxiousness and uncertainty about the future, she looks back. And looking back, she reflects on God's faithfulness, seeing God's hand in the everyday, seeing his faithfulness at every turn in the mundane that's not at all mundane because it's the fabric of our very lives. In classwork, ministry, jobs, stepping out of comfort zones, having fun in community. And as she reflects, she looks back on four years and sees God's faithful hand there. And she's brought to trust in his continued faithfulness, seeing him faithful. And I know that he will be faithful. She says, I think I'll be fine because my God is with me. Now we stop there for a moment, and, and I'm grateful that we can look back to our own experience. We can see God's faithfulness and his faithful hand in our lives. But to see the full revelation, the full extent of God's faithfulness, we look back a bit further. We look at his faithfulness from the very beginning of time. We look back to where God was faithful to Adam and Eve in the face of their disobedience, where he clothed them in skins, foreshadowing the clothing in righteousness that he would one day bring. He was faithful to Noah, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was faithful to Moses, to Israel, to Rahab, and Ruth, and Mary. He was faithful to his son, to his apostolic messengers. And for me, when we talk about faithfulness and we're looking at scripture, Abraham always stands out. At 75 years old, an older man already, right? God calls him to leave his home and go out, and he makes him a promise. He promises him land, and he promises him descendants. At 85 years old, 10 years later, he comes again, and he promises him again descendants, as numerous as the stars that he could see. And then he backs up the promise by saying, I'm going to promise on my very self. And he there cuts a covenant with Abraham, one of the most interesting and powerful and beautiful pieces of scripture where God has Abraham cut these animals in half and then God manifests himself and he comes and he walks through the animals. And it's a treaty, a covenant treaty that God is making with Abraham. And he's saying, Abraham, as you've cut these animals apart, I will be the one to go through these. And if I'm unfaithful to my promises, let that judgment fall upon my head. The living God swore by himself that he'd be faithful to his promises. So that's 10 years after the initial promise. And then at 86, he has a son, um, Ishmael, with Hagar. Um, Sarah got a little bit impatient. At 99 years old, he's an old man. His body has gotten old. His mind has gotten older. But God appears again and he says, you're going to have a son with Sarah, and he's going to be the one through whom your descendants will come. And he laughs, and Sarah laughs, and I think God laughs with them because it's absurd, and the only way that it could happen is by the faithfulness of their loving and merciful and living God. And one year later, Isaac is born, the son of laughter, Abraham's joy. And when you look at that, and then you fast forward we don't know exactly how many years, but now, and now Isaac is a young boy. And Abraham has been called to take him to Mount Moriah and to sacrifice him. And Abraham looks back on God's faithfulness. He looks back and he remembers what God has done and what God has promised and how God has promised on himself. And he sees over and over faithful, 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 faithful all the way through. And he comes to one conclusion. He's standing on top of a mountain. His son is bound. He's raised a dagger to kill him, and he has one thought. If he actually does it, God's going to raise him from the dead because he's faithful to his promises. Beautiful. 
he looks back to God's faithfulness so that he can look forward and understand what God is going to continue to do. As we look to his faithfulness in the past, we can say with the author of Hebrews, in, in all honesty, hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So as we, we remember who God is, remember what God has done and what he promises to do, it makes sense that Paul would tell us that the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, is ours when we come to Jesus with our anxiety and our requests. We look back to God's faithfulness because we know that is our covenant God so that when we look forward to his promises we know that he will be faithful in carrying them out there's a final reminder in Victoria's words she says I am not defined by my speech the father's grace is sufficient especially in my weaknesses and he hasn't failed to remind me of that in these past four years last week Dr. Green in chapel he cautioned us against the siren call to just be yourself. And I admit that I've told my daughters um, more times than I could count, just be yourself. And, and I started to unpack what was under that. Like, what, what have I been saying to my daughters when I'm actually saying to them, just be yourself? Uh, because as Dr. Green kind of cautioned us and reminded us, don't just be yourself. Because God has so much more for you to be. But what I've been saying to my daughters without all of the words is, is remember who you are in Christ. That's what I've been meaning when I've said to them, just be yourself. And I haven't fully unpacked that with them, but I think they understand that's what I mean. Don't just be yourself, but do know and remember who you are in Christ, because that is what defines us. That is where we find our value, not in our speech, not in our accomplishments, not in things you see in LinkedIn, Facebook, but in what our Savior says about us. That we are forgiven of our sin by virtue of the price that Jesus paid on the cross. A price that we could never pay on our own. That we are adopted as children of God. He is our Father. That we're brothers and sisters knit together by the blood of Jesus Christ. That our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit which lives and dwells in us. That we're new creatures in Christ, that the old is gone and the new has come. And that we are people for whom the grace of God is sufficient. People in whom God's power is made perfect, not in our strength, but in our weakness. And we have life and we have adventure with our God who is with us to the very end of the age. Our God for whom nothing can separate us from his love. And then Victoria ends it. So if you're looking for someone who may not be your typical employee, hit me up. If there's anybody out there listening, like in this, online or whatever, hit Victoria up. Uh, you may have to be extra patient with understanding her, but she'll work extra hard to compensate for that. I do not hold Victoria up as our example, but instead I do hold the Jesus that she loves up as our hope. In her transparent words, in her fear and ours, we're reminded to draw into Jesus. We remember what he has done and what God has done in our lives and in history. We see his constant and abiding faithfulness, and we know that he who has been is he who will be, that his promises are trustworthy and sure. And so we stand, our identity shaped by our Savior. We are people unworthy but loved, fearfully and wonderfully made, and defined by our status as sons and daughters of the King. That is who we are, gathered together to worship our God. And then, and this might be my favorite part of the whole thing, um, she says, oh wait, where is it? And in return, we've been having the best dang adventure of my life. Friends, hear that. We hold on for the adventure of truly living. There, there, is, there is a difference between existing and living. And our God comes into our lives that we might live and truly live, that we might have life 
and have it to the full. So hold on, because it's an adventure, and it is crazy, and it is hard, but it is joyous, and it is what we are created for, to walk with our Savior and to glorify him as we do it. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are our faithful covenant God. We thank you, Lord, that you are the same today, you are the same tomorrow, you are the same a thousand years ago and a thousand years from now. We thank you, Father, that your promises are sure and true, and they are our very hope. Father, be with us today, I ask. May we know your presence, may we know your presence clearly. Um, and I pray that you will give uh, all of the students who are visiting here an extra measure of your grace and your mercy and your peace. Father, be with us as we go forward, and may we, Lord, glorify you even in our weakness. We pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Please stand. Praise God. Go in peace.